ahead of myself there. Welcome back. This is Africa News Network. My name is Cindy Mabi. Now, SA Chamber of Mines has applied for an urgent interdict in the Gauteng High Court to stop the implementation of the third mining charter. The chamber says the charter will destroy the industry and that it's an example of a minister acting beyond his powers. The charter was uh, published on the 15th of June. The application lodged today says the charter was so obviously beyond the powers of the minister and that in publishing the 2017 charter, the minister has purported to exercise powers which reside exclusively with Parliament, which he has sought to usurp. The Chamber has accused the Department of Mineral Resources of negotiating in bad faith by producing a final version of the third iteration of the Charter, containing elements it says it had not seen before and not discussed with the Department. The Charter set new outlines for mining and prospecting companies to meet for targets of black ownership, procurement of goods and services, employment and environmental affairs. And Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa assured the National Education, Health and Allied Workers Union that the ANC supports workers. This happened at the union's 11th National Congress earlier today. The Congress is the highest decision-making body of the union and has powers to adopt new policies, resolutions and also elect new national office bearers. Addressing the workers, Ramaphosa highlighted the lives uh, that the lives of the South African workers need to be improved. He reiterated that the ANC will always stand with the working class because they are the driving force behind the party. The deputy president also says that the presidency is set to launch a judicial inquiry into state capture. I'm also here, President, to immediately give you the assurance that the ANC, in relation to the question that you raised, Ugoti, where do we stand? Do we stand with the workers? or do we stand with the bosses? The ANC is not confused. It has never been confused. We've always declared our irrevocable bias to the working class of our country. We have always sought to, work, to have a working class bias. And in fact, we don't even have to choose Mongame. There is no choice to be made. We know where we stand. And where we stand is with the working people of our country. We need to address this issue of state capture because it seems to demonstrate that there's been undue external influence over appointments, over procurement decisions within public institutions. Now, what we need to do, comrades, is to welcome the announcement by the president that he will soon be appointing a judicial commission of inquiry to investigate all these allegations. And a developing story uh, that we've been following out for a couple of weeks now, the SIEX founder Michael Oatley has blown uh, the cover of former South African Reserve Bank Governor Tito Mboweni's claims regarding the APSA lifeboat. Reacting to Mboweni's social media post, Oatley says the remarks are disingenuous in nature with a suggestion of racial patronization. Pointing out missing information in Mboweni's account of the probe into the bank or blown, Oatley offers a more accurate history that he says can be fully verified. Oatley claims evidence is in the possession of the public protector. And in the post are the former Reserve Bank uh, head or governor since 1998, Dumboweni, a British bounty hunter, came to them to say that there was a debt that was had to repay the new, uh, or new South Africa. Rather, Michael Oatley sets the tone correct and he says his agency produced documents that showed APSA was liable to pay back 1.5 billion rand with interest. But when he says Michael Oatley wanted 10% for a fee for helping to retrieve the stolen monies, Oatley says there was an agreement that Sire should be incentivized to devote his resources almost exclusively to this task. He says that he was not being greedy by asking for 10% as the normal commission
charged by international debt recovery agencies is 33 percent. And then Reserve Bank Governor rejected the offer, saying the matter would not be pursued, despite having confirmed that SIEX was right. Moeni says after an independent investigation headed by Judge and its recommended, act, that would be Judge Davis, and its recommended actions, the AFSA Lifeboat Probe was concluded. But Oakley contradicts him. He says the team appointed by the Reserve Bank, in fact, confirmed the SIEX's version that the Bangkok loan was illegal. And finally, Mboweni's post said, seems to defend his decision not to take action against APSA to return the billions owed by the bank, citing a threat to the stability of the banking and financial system. Oatley rubbishes the argument, saying the public protector's report is clear that repayment in installments should be uh, should have been posted, or rather posed, uh, wouldn't pose any risk to APSA or the banking system. And he says uh, APSA management in itself calculated they could do so in four annual payments of 800 million rand without da damage to the bank or its operations. End quote. Okay, so it is quite a, a mouthful, and I mean, it's a lengthy investigation uh, stemming almost 20 years that has been sitting with the Reserve Bank and the Public Protector, as you've heard, APSA saying that they are not liable to pay back any money, and uh, with Judge Davis also saying that their account is correct. The Public Protector, in fact, has now been criticized for her role in uh, the recommendations that the Reserve Bank needs to reform uh, its mandates. Zanele Luana is Deputy National Convener of Black First Land First Movement. Mr. Carl Niehaus, MKMVA. NEC member joins us on the line and I'm Zwanele Mani is the founder of the Decolonization Foundation. You're at home, always good to have you. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us. I mean, what are the latest developments besides the rebuttal from the founder of the SIEX report who himself was uh, employed to come and investigate whether a uh, fund uh, or the lifeboat needed to be paid back? I'll start with you, Zanele. Ladies first. Yes, um... We should keep in mind that people like Dito Mboweni belong today to a group of key leaders in South Africa who have aligned themselves clearly with the agenda of advancing uh, white settler monopoly capital today. That's why Dito Mboweni is suffering from amnesia today and forgets that he was part of the team and governance that commissioned the private-owned company called CX to launch a probe into the apartheid era corruption in this country. But also, we must not be surprised by the remarks that have been made by Titombowene because we know today he works for a London-linked company called Goldman Sachs, a company that has been recently charged by the government of the United States of America on corruption, on the manipulation of currency to an amount of at least 120 million rands, uh, U.S. dollars. So um, we must not be surprised. Um, Tito Mboweni, he dismisses the report today, but when he was in government, when he was um, the, the, the governor of the South African Reserve Bank, he even went further on top of the CIX report and, uh, and formed a commission that would launch a probe into the apartheid era crime, a commission that had reached the same conclusions with the CIX report to say ABSA benefited illegally from the billions that were looted from the South African Reserve Bank. You don't think, yeah, that's reason enough to say at the time the pragmatic decision to make is for the stability of the financial sector and the country considering the reconciliatory phase that we're still going through, and that was the only option that but, uh, the Reserve Bank governor had. But as the former chairman of the CX company, Michael Oatley, has said that the bank APSA was ready to pay back this money in installments of 800 million rands, um, and I'm sure that the institution that is APSA today had made the calculations to make sure that it would not result in a financial crisis in this country. So there was will already from the perpetrators who were charged with corruption of benefiting illegally from such big amounts of money, but we see that through the likes of Tito when there was no political will to recover this money. And we know that the current public protector is being demonized today. We know that during the term of Tulima Donzela, the findings of the public protector were binding and they had to be followed. But because it's someone like Busim Kwebane who seems to be pressing on into the issues of corruption that 
uh, are within the DNA of where South Africa is today, we have a different response because we know people like Tito Mboweni, as they are servants of the Queen in London, are going to oppose any agenda that is going to implicate white settler monopoly capital represented by ABSA today. Yeah, well, somebody else would say, you look, it's, it's very convenient to malign Tito Mboweni. He's now out of office. He's done well for the country during his tenure. Why now this particular report? Uh, why wasn't it concluded? even five years ago, ten years ago? Yeah, <clears throat> look, I think, f first let me just say that uh, I think Tito Mboweni and Mike Oakley are probably, both of them are civilians. Uh, so what they say uh, is that democratic right to say whatever they say. I don't think we should take any of that very seriously. What we should take seriously is what the public protector, an institution of democracy, what is it that that institution is saying? That institution is saying South Africa is owed 1.125 billion rand by, 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 by APSA, and they make a very clear case of a situation where there was daylight robbery, where a situation where Bangkok would make a loan of 1.5 billion at 1% and reinvest that same money with the Reserve Bank at 16%. So all the perpetrator is saying today is saying South Africa is owed the differential of 15% which works out to 1.125 billion. So I don't think th this discussion is complicated. Uh, all that needs to happen now is that APSA, the new owner, and by the way, some of these discussions that uh, APSA is saying about uh, debt having prescribed and all of these uh, other nonsensical uh, arguments, uh, they don't actually hold course uh, because we're sitting here with a situation of public money. The, the issue of prescription of debt does not even arise because we have a situation, they can be excluded if it does, if, if it does arise, purely because we have a public interest issue here. Public players has been raided uh, to the tune of over a billion rand, and us as South Africans, as taxpayers in this country, we really want our money back. Uh, and APSA was a transacting, Bangkok was a transacting entity, has become APSA. APSA has bought Bangkok both assets and liabilities. This is a liability of Bangkok that APSA must take uh, responsibility for. So this discussion mustn't be complicated. No, 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 but uh, I mean it is complicated because they, they, they're differing versions of it in terms of the Judge uh, Dennis Davis Commission. Um, and what, what had come out of that was that, yes, there may be a liability, but we don't know who exactly is supposed to pay. No. Is it the bank corp shareholders that were given the money before APSA took a position thereof? But I don't want to get into to that. Rather, in, in whether there is a case to be made here. Somebody was saying the public protector could be onto something. On the other side, we hear uh, arguments that she's well over, over her, her jurisdiction or her powers. We also know, remember this report that implicates ABSA on this amount of corruption has been sitting on the public protector's office during the reign of advocate Tulima Dwensela for five years. It was swept under the table because we have seen how the office of the public protector has been changed into a political weapon for regime change. What matters now is that ABSA is a bank worth billions today that continues to exploit our people, has been found guilty to have benefited illegally from public funds that were looted outside the South African Reserve Bank. APSA has to pay back the money. But anyway, we have seen the arrogance in which the, the, the CEO of APSA, Maria Ramos, has came out publicly, confidently saying we are taking the matter to court. We are not going to pay back the money because they understand how the media and how public view is manipulated to excuse white criminal organizations such as banks from wrongdoing in this country. That's why as the Black First Land First movement, we are going to start with pickets on Wednesday on all APSA branches around Johannesburg. If APSA does not commit on paying back this money. We are going to shut it down because it's an insult to black people. If it was Brian Mulefe, if it was Dudumieni, if it was President Zuma or any other black leader who was implicated on such massive corruption, we would be singing a totally different tune today. But because it's a white institution, it's white settler monopoly capital, it's how white people 
have used the state during apartheid to build cartels to benefit themselves, we must not touch them. It's in total fact, arrogance. <coughs> we must not tolerate it as black in, people. In fact, protein. this brings to question the roles of these uh, so-called uh, corruption institutions like your Cossacks of this world. Where is Sipopikiana now and save South Africa when we need our billion rand? Where is the uh, freedom under law uh, uh, institution when we need this? Where are all these... Uh, uh, people that are forever, Section 27, all of this is uh, a corruption watch. One of course has a big corruption on our hands, which just shows that this is all indeed uh, part of the regime change uh, uh, activities. All these uh, sprawling NGOs and foundations uh, are there to prop up a regime change agenda. So we're saying for us at the Decolonization Foundation that uh, we are fully behind the puppet protector. The puppet protector is within her rights. The South African Reserve Bank is an organ of state. She has got a duty and a responsibility and a jurisdiction over it, and she's exercising it, and she's exercising it correctly. So what she's doing is very much uh, in line. Yeah. All right, let's invite uh, Carl Niehaus as MKNVA, a National Executive Committee member. Good evening to you, Carl, and thanks so much for your time. Uh, it's very interesting, the response from Michael Oakley, setting the record straight in a sense that uh, there's uh, prima facie or enough evidence sitting with the Public Protector's Office that this money or the, the conclusion of the SIAX report was to pay back the money and that there was consensus somehow that there, is, um, there had been wrongdoing. And yet we, we seem to have more denialism uh, from the uh, greater part of uh, corporate South Africa. Well, Cindy, let me first of all say that no one should even ask the question, why is the public protector investigating this matter and why did she bring out this report? If this is not the kind of case that she should be investigating, then I don't know what her role is. Clearly, we have here government money, taxpayers' money that has been abused, that has been used in the wrong way, it has to be returned. Now, it is very strange that someone like Mr. Tito Mbuweni and some other people in the government sector seem to think that this is not necessary. One wonders why they have developed the very convenient argument that this will destabilize the market and it will destabilize the banking sector. While the bank itself, in the form of APSA, had indicated that it would be able to repay the money and, in fact, that they would not be destabilized. Now, I get the impression that someone like Mr. Omoweni has become so involved in this capitalist monopoly system that he is no longer able to see the wood for the trees. And in that situation, he is now turning himself into a defender of white monopoly capital rather than a defender of the people of South Africa. And this is a very serious matter. It is a matter that we need to address not only with regards to Mr. Mbuweni, but with regards to some of the comrades that we have in the African National Congress, and I include Mr. Trevor Manuel. People who have been part of the liberation struggle in South Africa. People who purport to fight for the rights of the majority of people. People who say that they care about the majority of South Africans. And yet, when it comes down to them taking decisions, when it comes down to them supporting the right position in terms of how taxpayers' money is being spent, they take the wrong decisions. Then suddenly, they are out there to support the system that has been oppressing the people of South Africa for centuries. It cannot be allowed that this is continuing to happen. That is why we have to ask ourselves, what do we do about comrades or former comrades who have allowed themselves to be captured by white monopoly capital? We cannot have Mr. Bumbuweni talking to us from London, trying to cover up the story, in the arrogant manner that he usually does, and then at the end of the day, everything is hunky-dory, we go ahead, we allow 1.25 billion rands to be lost from the South African fiscus. And remember, this is money that should pay for education. 
This is money that should pay for health care. All right, Carl, just stay on the line, please. Uh, we have Zamo Mazala, Black Empowerment Foundation, or from the Black Empowerment Foundation. Mr. Mazala, thanks so much for your time. What is the significance in your view of the response uh, from Michael Oatley, the author of the SIEX report? Hi, evening, Cindy. Um, well, the main thing is that what we're trying to do here is, is to simplify this for the public. Um, apartheid was declared a crime against humanity. Furthermore, after it was declared a crime against humanity, what we had was a process of the TRC, but there was never really any economic um, TRC or anything to that effect. So all of the looting that took place is sort of being covered and it's been covered under investigations that say, well, banking risk, and I personally don't understand what the banking risk is because the amount that is due and payable by APSA is actually only 2.5% plus minus of its current market capitalization. So where's the systemic risk to the entire banking sector? Now, it doesn't stop with APSA, it moves on, it goes to NetBank, it goes to Sunlam, there's, there's many, many a transaction that happened. And perhaps the risk is there that should the majority population wake up and realize that, no, we were taken for a ride. There were many crimes, I mean, we all know what happened after the Holocaust. Everyone was chased and, and monies were recovered. So why is it in the case of South Africa, we must take the word of Tito Mboweni, Pravin Godan, Trevor Manuel, telling us that no, this money can't be recovered. Mm. To date, we now have Net One, which has, got, which has gone out of its way to tell us that it made a billion in profits at a time when the tender that it was busy supplying was declared illegal and invalid. Yeah, please stay on the line, Mr. Mazat. I just want to get a response in the sense that a lot rests on the success or failure of the public protector's investigation uh, in what uh, Mr. Mazala was saying, in, in possibly opening the floodgates where we have the opportunity to scrutinize and see the resources that were looted and hopefully will be recovered so we deal with issues of disparity and inequalities. Anela, would you agree? I agree 100%. You know, it's rainbow nationalism that has led us into this mess we are trying to clean up today. To say that we are in a democratic state now, we must all start anew, it's a brand new day, therefore we must forget about all the crimes that were committed on the country, on black people at the receiving end of this whole looting and exploitation and killing of our own people. We have to extend the terms of reference. We have to probe into apartheid era crimes because even companies that exist today, companies linked to Johan Rupert, Remgro, uh, Daimler Chrysler, NetBank, all the net worth, all that they are worth today, it was through the wealth that they got illegally from looting the resources of the country against the will of the people. We cannot then act as if corruption is a new thing with the black government, whereas we know that this, all strategic sectors of the economy, the banking system, mining, insurance, all strategic sectors of the economy implicate white people around like criminal organizations to continue to marginalize black people. We must continue to extend the terms but of But you're not saying replace say, corruption, white corruption with black corruption. No, gonna, that's not what I'm just saying. Just for clarity. What I'm saying is that even in state-owned enterprises, that most of them fall in the hands of black managers today. If there's corruption there, we should press on and demand justice, but not this mess that we have today. If you ask an ordinary person on the street to tell you about corruption, the only thing they can think of is Saudis, Brian Mulef, and the president of the country. They don't know who Johan Rupert is. They don't know the family of the Oppenheimers. They don't know who Maria Ramos is. They don't know how criminal organizations that employ our people continue to loot resources out of the country. But it's packaged in such a way, it. yes, and I mean, we from a different perspective, though. It, it, when you say corruption, looting, you know, anybody else watching could say, life wasn't as bad under apartheid. Look, you know, we achieved re reconciliation. We now, the rainbow nation, whatever it is that uh, has been sold to us, to not correct, but to give a different perspective is not something that 
uh, that there is an easy fit. Yeah, look, I think the key issue here is where the country would have been had there not been this massive corruption. Because this is a corruption of huge proportions. This is not pickpocketing. Uh, we do not uh, condone the kind of corruption happening today. Although the kind of corruption happening today in the scheme of things is pickpocketing. Not that it must be excused, but it must be understood in proper context. It's pickpocketing. The huge bank robbery in the literal sense has happened. And APSA has robbed the bank to the tune of a billion rand. We can't take that, uh, we can't uh, 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 wipe that under the carpet. And we call upon the president to make sure that the recommendation by the public protector to institute and proclaim the SIU investigation on all those uh, entities that uh, collaborated with this, the president must uh, make that happen. Okay, and that's uh, what uh, the uh, CR17 also said. The uh, much-awaited judicial inquiry over and above a statement of capture also needs to um, widen the scope, as I guess have been saying. We still have Mr. Carl Niehaus. Very briefly, uh, Carl, we've seen uh, the EPSA Bank taking the matter on review. This is a, a, a litmus test, I suppose, for the public protector, her findings, what her powers are, and how far this matter will go. Well, Cindy, it's of course interesting that APSA immediately, just within almost minutes after the announcement by the public protector, said that they will not pay the money back and they're taking it on review. And these are the same people, I include Ms. Ramos in this, who in the past were so keen to support the previous public protector and who said that the findings of the public protector is binding. Suddenly for APSA and for their supporters now, the findings of the public protector is not binding. So you're quite right. This is a litmus test. It is critical that we go through this process. And I sincerely hope that by the end of it, we will have a finding that will say that the public protector's findings was absolutely correct and that APSA will be forced to pay back the money, not just for the sake of this particular issue with concern to APSA, but for the sake of the future of the role of the public protector in South Africa and for the sake, as we have said to each other today in this debate, for the sake of making sure that all the other looting that has been taking place in South Africa will also be addressed. We cannot continue with the situation where people just seem to be able to willy-nilly walk away with a billion rand or more just because they are part of a so-called white capitalist monopoly system that shouldn't be disturbed because if they disturb them, they're going to blackmail us with all kinds of economic processes, with downgradings and all of these things. Let's stop that. All right, Let's Mr. Niehaus, sure we're going to have to leave it there. Can be Last word, Mr. Mazala. Um, just in, in terms of where this matter could or could not take the country. Is there an alternative? We've spoken about uh, reform or rather transformation. Others saying, you know, uh, this radicalism is not what the country can afford at the moment. Your view? Well, to be quite frank, I think what, what we actually need is, a, is the economic TRC now where things must be aired out in public and we all know what happened and then and then there must be reparations on the part of the companies, how they come up with those suggestions, and we, we can all then have a discussion. But the current narrative that has been put out, that this must just be left and swept under the carpet, that won't wash. Okay. So we must get down to the bottom of it all. We're going to have to leave it there, I'm afraid. The beautiful game, uh, uh, Len Moleko and his team are standing by. I wish I could just uh, ask for a finale, a swan song where we say, Baga, Baga, Gwenzi, Jan. I, I couldn't resist. But thanks indeed for watching from myself and the crew. Be abundantly blessed. Cheers for now.